Hello, you're, you're listening, listening to the, the Record Ceremony, Ceremony podcast, podcast with Miles, Miles Bonney. Yes. Yes. True. Welcome back to Record Ceremony. As we continue to enjoy this blessing of sound. Welcome to the latest edition of the Record Ceremony podcast. Um, if you heard the last two versions... Um, it's probably because you know that I'm a recording person. I like recordings and I like music and the conversations were with the really good people, but the quality was really bad because I did it over the phone and you know, I'm kind of a content person. So I appreciate what they had to say, release them. That being said, this conversation is going to be hopefully a little bit better audio quality, quality for you because we are live here in Taos, New Mexico. And, um, I'm excited to share, um, additional conversations with you because, I think conversations are wonderful to to learn from and listen to, and uh, we keep it uh, diverse and honest out here, so whatever. Uh, My name is Miles, and we want to go around and just introduce ourselves, and I'll kind of keep that over there. You guys can lean in a bit when you talk, but that's cool, or, you know. Listeners of the Record Ceremony uh, radio show know me as uh, the Transconductor, Neurosynapsis, and I'm here to uh, introduce some great friends of mine, and... uh, yeah, uh, this is Lucas Marcus and Gladue and Shannon Freeman, two young, strong voices from Native America, and we're here to just share some information tonight, uh, uh, some stuff you might never heard of about uh, the real America. You know, there's a lot of debate these days about what, it, what America is and who represents America, and uh, we're here to correct some uh, misconceptions. Yeah. There you go, moving around. We're rocking the one mic, so, you know, the rough sound continues. I can't, I just keep it raw. <laughs> Hi, my name is Shannon Freeman, and um, I come from a Native American and African American background, which is what got me int- interested in the topic of um, the mixing and um, uh, the Americas and more positive stories of it in, rather than negative. Cool. And we can probably just keep it there, you know, whatever. Yeah, and I'm Lucas Marcus and Gladue. I, um, uh, I'm glad to be here, being able to share on this podcast and uh, be able to just uh, kind of turn a different light on a lot of the things we're seeing going on in media today. And, you know, uh, through my studies and stuff thus far, I've, I've found out a lot of things about, about history that I didn't know, you know, that's really been turn a light on in my mind about where we really came from in America and you know we really just kind of want to push that out there tonight and let you guys you know get inform some people on on some good information that we found that we think we think is really powerful for America today you know so I think it's going to be a good time to share the information so thank you guys for being willing to share whatever it is you want to share And um, just for some context, those of you who have heard either past episodes or at least the radio show, um, no transconductor. And um, how do how do you all three of you know each other? Just to kind of bring some context to that. Man, uh, so one of the topics tonight we're going to talk about is uh, cultural appropriation. You know, and appropriation just means that you make it your own. But uh, me and this guy have been knowing each other since we were about, what, 10 years old. One of my best memories of this guy was when rollerblades first came out. <laughs> we got our hands on one pair of rollerblades, man. <laughs> so, he, you know, we'd take turns. One person would skate and the other person would run. And then one person running would get tired of this. Okay, time to switch. We'd switch and the yeah. other person put on the skates, you know. So uh, That's friends right there. Yeah, man. And... Uh, so his family's helped me out a lot, a lot over the years. His dad, you know, anytime I had trouble as a young man, I knew I could go to their house and his mom and dad take care of me. And it was really nice to have that, um, you know, that Native American perspective on things and that worldview, you know. And uh, we just wanted to share this with you because I know a lot of people, you know, you, you moved here years ago, and mm-hmm. I know it's been an eye-opener to you to come to Native America. Totally. A lot of people in the world think, think that the Natives were exterminated, but the fact is that so many survived, so, you know, beyond, despite all the pressure. And so uh, I want to introduce this guy. He's Cree, and his nation uh, is, the, is it not the biggest Native nation in North America? Yeah, from what I understand, it's the largest Aboriginal nation right now. 
stuff in the world, you know, the Cree Nation stretches all over Canada and well, it's, uh, it's, pretty, it's bigger than I ever imagined really once I started looking into it, you know, and then uh, pretty much finding out, you know, like, um, I guess going back to just me and me and Sam, you know, this guy at a young age, you know, just knowing each other and, you know, I came up in the, in the same little town and it, you know, it was, um, I guess we we kind of had a lot of the same upbringing in that town, but at the same time, I I met a lot of different uh, obstacles, I guess you'd call them. So uh, it was just a different kind of outline. So it stretched us apart, you know. And uh, Sam went his own way, and he actually went all over the world, you know. From geez, when was it? When did you first leave? You were so young. It was sixteen or seventeen. Yeah, right. And and then you went to Turkey right away, and. You know, so this yeah. guy was all over the world, and you know, I had I had been going through my struggles in in life, you know, and I had been in some bad positions, and you know, through all the friends you have in your life, you know, and this guy, he's he's always stood by me, you know, and when I needed that letter or that postcard, you know, this guy was always there for me, and yeah. it kind of held that friendship together, and then through the years we would kind of just wind up in Green River at the same times and, you know, hang out at my parents and have some good talks and kind of catch up on where we've been and always plan, seemed like, for years, right? You know, how 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 we were going to get together and finally, yeah. you know, start compiling our thoughts together. <laughs> you know? Is this... Uh... I imagine this isn't the beginning of that. Have you guys done anything that you envision in that way? Previously, you're not really. Man, we we just came back from an epic, epic elk hunt. Oh, and, no, uh, you got yeah. We got a chance to hunt elk together, and it was epic this year, brother. Like, wow. uh, we, we were ninjas out there, man. Yeah. We were. We had good medicine from good people, and we know all our old people were praying for us. We could feel that, you know, because we're having wild experiences out there. And uh, one thing that crossed my mind when we were out there. <clears throat> Uh, we had separated, and I had seen an elk. I took a shot, and mm -hmm. then and then Luke, I saw Luke coming into my frame of view, maybe, I don't know, 50, 60 yards away. And he's seen, a, he, he's seen that same group of elk that yeah. had moved after I took my shot. Mm -hmm. And so we were uh, not wanting to speak, you know. And so Luke started signing to me. He said, and I could tell by his signs, he said, look, I see a few up in there. Be quiet. And uh, and then I signed back to him, I've already taken a shot. I think I hit one in the side. And we understood each other perfectly using signs. And the cool thing about Native America, um, the natives here, independent of their linguistic group or tribe, they had the same sign language, brother. Yeah. And that's straight from living in nature where you don't always want to be talking and making sounds. Mm. Yeah. you know. And so that was the first time it really dawned on me heavy, like, oh, sign language, of yeah. course, like... Yeah. You know, before the walkie-talkie mm -hmm. in, in, in the hunt, in warfare, yeah. you would need that sign language. You wouldn't want to be talking, yeah. even whispering, right? Yeah. So that was really cool for me. So, yeah, and, and he's been helping me, uh, man, in so many ways, you know, around mm -hmm. uh, we've been building. Is this the first and, time you came to visit Sam in New Mexico? Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, how's that been? Because I know that you guys are in Wyoming, right? Right. As, as young well, kids, whatever. No. Yeah, as as kids, I, I and I went to Montana after. After that period. Know, yeah, and so I was in Montana for a lot of years, and then uh, we we just happened to come together. I came across some uh, situations in my life with my financial aid and the school and stuff. And yeah. Things were getting really frustrating, and uh, it just happened to be that uh, I called. I'm pretty sure I called you, right? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I, I got a hold of Sam, and it just happened to be that he, he needed some stuff done, and I was at a place where I needed somewhere to go, <laughs> and he had had this whole plan for these bees. He wanted oh, to yeah. start. Yeah, yeah, so he wanted to start doing these bees, and he had mentioned bringing a hive down from Wyoming, and so I happened to be in Wyoming at the time, and I was like, well, I'll go get the hive and bring it to you. You know, and so and then it's just kind of been on from there, and it's been really interesting, everything that's bloomed in such a short time, you know, like just us coming back together and being able to 
you know, talk and have some good discussions about where we're going and where we've been, you know, and it's, yeah. it's pretty amazing. So I need to brag on this guy because he won't brag on himself, but he's up. He's been up uh, making sense of these tree scars. Okay. From from and correct me if I'm wrong, but is from these times of starvation that were brought on by and they'll talk about it about the disappearance of the buffalo. Buffalo didn't disappear. It wasn't some magic trick. It was a systematic slaughter massacre of the primary food source of all these nomadic tribes that live in North America. And so Luke's been up. He can he can this man walks through the woods. He can tell based on tree bark. How close the camp would be set. Tell us a little bit about what you've been studying, man, right, because yeah, it's fascinating. So, um, I got into these studies in uh, tribal historic preservation, and um, we had a, a grant to do a survey up in Glacier National Park. And what we were looking for is scarred, traditionally scarred trees, culturally scarred trees. Uh-huh. And the Forest Service wanted us to do this survey in order to lay protections in order for those areas so they could do more studies and find out more about this, you know, because it was kind of new to them as well. So um, when I went up there, I found out, like, uh, there there was a lot more just to the trees, you know, and and we, we could decipher a lot from just the placement of the tree. Uh-huh. And uh, it was pretty interesting when you date a tree back to say 173 years ago and then you you pull up some articles from those days and newspaper articles and you see all these things about people starving and super bad weather and this and that and the thing was at that time the native people didn't uh that was a normal thing for them that wasn't using the cambium layer of a tree wasn't a survival technique that had been used for a long time just real quick for the listeners cambium layer is that the bark or what does that mean yes that's a layer of uh, it's almost like a sugary layer in between the bark and the actual wood of the tree and you're saying that's something that was done later on that wasn't traditionally a part of the relationship well with the it tree? was done earlier as okay. a survival technique but right. i'm talking like five six hundred years ago okay gotcha okay and then it kind of was phased out through uh, different better hunting techniques and then obviously trade came in and so the starvation wasn't as big of an issue yeah. until the government got set up and started putting aside these reservations and then the Indians started starving and then they started sneaking away from the reservation and going back up and using this old technology to survive you know and so I went through and when I found we were just mostly finding the trees and documenting their location and what i realized is that those trees they're uh, a document in itself it you know they have to be i found out the processing of the cambium had to be done in a certain time Mm. and so you could only hike so far in a couple hours you know you had to have a fire ready a lot of things had to happen and so every one of those trees had to include a processing site within a short distance and um, I was able to tie these little things together and they were really adding up and it just turned into a lot of fun. And uh, I find out from some guys that work in Washington, D.C. that my outlook on the whole ordeal was far beyond how any of their archaeologists and anthropologists would have looked at the situation. Wow. And so, and this is that, that sort of conversation... Um, occurred while you were working with did you say was it the forest service or it was for the it was for the united states government okay but it's uh i was working through salish kootenai college okay and were they based just stay there they're in uh the flathead valley in montana okay um out it's in pablo montana yeah i was just curious so yeah and we've been me and shannon both been attending there and it's a it's all tribal school, and uh, they accept everybody, but their curriculum is just a little different. And, mm-hmm. uh, they they got me into the preservation, which I didn't have any idea what it was really going to lead me into. Mm. And now the uh, school has kind of adopted a new term called indigenous archaeology, and uh, it just makes so much sense. Yeah, to you. I'm like, it's. Yeah, <laughs> it's really it's really changing things. And my one archaeology professor, he uh, he kind of 
made a step towards the the future of it really you know in one of his findings you know he um they were studying these what they believed to be eagle catching pits on the tops of these mountains mm. that they would find all over the place and these ar archaeologists had been studying them for years and documenting them and mm -hmm. putting them into books and everything else and uh uh, my teacher, uh, Aaron Breen, he went and looked at these same things, and he told them immediately what they were, which they were fasting beds, mm. in which the native people used to go up on high points, and they'd stack rocks in a circle, and they'd lay in there, and they'd fast and pray, mm. you know. And uh, it was, they couldn't believe it, you know. They had, to, they had to change everything they wrote Those down in their of, books. And they they're must like, have been wow, like, what are we doing now? This Indian guy just showed <laughs> up out of nowhere. And it also shows, like, they never tried to catch an eagle from there. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> how are we going to catch an eagle from a... <laughs> I mean, you haven't spent much time around eagles if you right. think that's an eagle catching yeah. thing. So that's why the indigenous archaeology is really, you know, I think going to make a dr drastic imprint on the whole... Archaeology, our archaeology world today. You know what I mean. Makes total sense. Sorry, let me just. Anyway, um, amazing. <laughs> we introduce a beautiful yeah, woman. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Tell us about where you come from. Yeah, share whatever you'd like. Yeah, go ahead, share. Um, well, I grew up in Rocky Boy, Montana, and Great Falls, Montana. Um, like mostly around uh, Native Americans. And they come from a mixed race, so I always felt like I didn't know exactly where I belonged. So, you know, that's what got me into psychology in, in general. And then and then I found the school, um, the Salish Kootenai College, and they had psychology for a bachelor's degree. And, and it also included, like, um, Native American studies and things like that. And, from you know, like more psychology from that perspective of them, which was interesting. And, and that, that led me into finding more about, you know, people like me, like mm. that there, there have always been people like <laughs> me from like, for like, since slaves came here, mm. like they ran away and many tribes took them in, mm. you know, and that, that was pretty amazing. And then, um, I didn't even realize like my, um, my grandma it, from Texas is an African American woman. And she, you know, always said she's, um, Native American and, you know, they, they do seem, you know, they're different looking, but um, um, I, you know, getting into reading about the history of our country, um, I found the uh, my grandma's surname in a book about um, the African American um, that were slaves of the Native Americans from the, what yeah, were they? The, the Seminole. Yeah, the Seminoles. Yeah. Yeah. The Seminole. yeah. Wow. So, like, um, you know, the, I think she's right. Like, you know, yeah. they they always say black people are like, oh, I'm Cherokee. But, you know, yeah. a lot of it is true. Yeah, They're right. from the South, yeah. you know. I mean, I certainly have never learned or was taught anything like that, mm -hmm. you know, in high school. So it is that secondary. Yeah. Later in life, you know, it's whether you go to college or not, it's so great to just take it further on. Mm -hmm. yeah. To yeah. put the pieces together. The Spanish yeah. were trying to hold on to Florida. And they said anybody who fought for them to keep Florida would be free. Yeah. So oh, all Lord these de uh, all these displaced native tribes and all these escaped Africans ended up in the Everglades, mm. you know, and they had their own maroon communities. Um, there was a huge one uh, called Council Prospect in the Panhandle of Florida. They took they took over an old British garrison, mm. hundreds of people, and 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 they even beat the Texas Rangers to the border. No, they captured Osceola, but there was a, a black Seminole named John, John Horace, Horace yeah. Juan mm. Caballo. And he led the, the remaining members of that band in this mad race to the Mexican border. bro. Mm. And they beat the Texas Rangers, barely made it across. He saved that whole crew of people. And so now still in uh, Coahuila, Mexico, um, these communities exist and they speak their own language which is the Gullah people. I don't know yeah. if you know the Gullah mm -hmm. Geechee. Yeah. So those were the, that was the language that ended up mixing with the native languages. And that's what became spoken in the Oklahoma territories when everyone was taken on the Trail of Tears out there. Oh, man. And so the real Lone Ranger was black. The first U.S. Marshal west of the Mississippi 
was black. And why? Mm. Because he spoke this afro seminal language and could communicate. Oh, it pisses me off so much. Because it's so wonderful to know, apparently, the truth, right? Yeah. But it's so bothersome just to learn, you know? But it's also beautiful, because <laughs> it's also beautiful, because, like, we're Wyoming cowboys, right? Yeah. Yeah. And there's not a big black presence in, in Wyoming, but the word cowboy yeah. is specifically black. Yeah. A white man would be called a cow hand. Mm -hmm. They called mm -hmm. a black man a cowboy. I am getting to, it. You know what I'm right, saying? So, so if you talk about cowboy, it's, they say maybe one out of three. I think that's a low estimate. Oh, yeah. I think probably most of the cowboys were black. You know what I mean? And that was af right after the Civil War. So that was the first chance people had to like go west yeah. and be free. Yeah. And, and, and there was still discriminant. There was a great cowboy from Wyoming called Isham Dart. Yeah. And uh, he said, if you want to survive in Wyoming, you better first, right off the bat, get a Shoshone wife. Yeah. And that's how common it was. Mm. Yeah. There was another black cowboy, Nat Love. He got taken by the Pima Indians. He said they didn't kill him because they were all half African. So that tells you long before yeah. him, long before the Civil War, long before, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. that that was happening. Yeah. And so um, Shannon is representative, like, you're the face of America, you know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. like, people don't know that. Mm -hmm. Not here, not internationally, you know? Mm -hmm. right. And I want Luke to talk about the Iron Confederacy that existed mm -hmm. up north when the original like European voyageurs and trappers came and started right. interacting with the Cree and Assiniboine. Right. Right. So up in the north where I'm from, where we're both from, me and Shannon, well, actually, even before that, I wanted to say something about Shannon here. Like, it wouldn't have, I, I, I don't believe I would even be in this position, you know, to be, even be talking like this or sharing any kind of knowledge or or if I ever would have even went back to school, you know, if it wasn't for her, you know. Uh, huh. She's really changed my mind and talked to me about a lot of things. And Did you guys meet at the college or beforehand? Beforehand. Before oh, wow. I ever, I would have never thought of ever going to college <laughs> again, you know. And uh, yeah. when I met her, she was uh, in the middle of her, her degree. And it was like, you know, I was really interested in it. And then, she, so she really sold me on all of this stuff, you know, wow, and that's what's really that's expanded great. my mind. So I just wanted to throw that in there, like, yeah, before I went any farther, so. Congrats to you both. Sounds like a good situation. <laughs> but with the, uh, the Iron Triangle, I was really surprised when I started finding out about this and reading about it. I've always kind of been in a search for my own identity, you know. Yeah. I didn't grow up around natives, you know, my, my parents kind of made sure of that, and uh, they they pulled us away from the, the reses. And the, As a means you know. of, like, trying to help you survive? You know, yeah, you I think, believe so, you, you know. Think they, like, what their perspective I, was? I think that's what it was, you know, that they, they found their lives so hard uh, as it was Quick being question. natives. Do you think that they or their answers had to go to any of those schools or anything like that that would have instilled that as a concept for them to want to pursue? In the same direction that I'm going now? Or? No, no, no. The, I mean, obviously, you're going, the, you're going back to the roots, you know right, what I'm saying? Right. Like, I'm just thinking generationally. Uh -huh. You know, maybe your parents, like, I wonder if their parents had to go to any of those, you know, those oh, like boarding schools, schools and stuff. Because I'm, you know, I'm curious about, like, the turn of the, at what points, maybe touch points in their lives. Well, what if, what if this, convinced them that that's the way for you? This to might trip you out a little bit, man. My my mom, you know, because both my parents got taken out of their homes and put into bo boarding schools. Yeah. And so uh, my dad's experiment, experience was totally different than my mom's. My mom, surprisingly enough, she she tells me that her experience at boarding school was good. Huh. And she enjoyed herself, and she was treated well. Okay. And people were nice to her. Uh, now, on her sister and her other brothers, her siblings, they have a whole different outlook. Did they go to different schools? No. Oh, same wow. school. And uh, her older sister, she has a whole different outlook on boarding school and natives in particular. You know, she's really kind of more anti-native these days, you know, and I think it's because of what happened to her at boarding schools and... Oh. 
Uh, she was in a lot of fights and stuff. Whereas my mom, she had a pretty good experience. And she tells me that. She says, you know, the nuns were really nice to me. Everybody was really nice to me. I didn't get beat up. Everybody was my friend. You know, and then whereas my dad, it was a whole different experience because he didn't speak English. And he had to learn how to speak English and he refused. And so they kept holding him back and holding him back to where, you know, it was a a real struggle for him, you know, when it came to education and and being native, you know. And I think how he battled it was through his work ability. And uh, just like his, my grandfather, my late grandfather, he worked and worked hard. And that's what my dad fell into. And it wasn't uh, so much that he had any kind of education or could even speak good English, but he could work super hard and nobody would ever question that, you know. Yeah. And so... I, my dad used that, and they 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 kind of ran down south with us and got us away from more of the Indians in the north. And my dad was chasing work in the oil field, and it was, you know, a lot of getting away from being an Indian. I know that. Mm. And so as a kid, I was always searching for that identity, you know. Mm -hmm. And it, it took a long time, and then. You know, getting into the schooling was really surprising to see what they left out, you know. Absolutely. And uh, it's, it was pretty ridiculous. But, it is ridiculous. Um, I really think my parents kind of did delay my education on who I am and my own identity. And purposefully so, I think, you know, because they were trying to help me. And because Indians do have quite a hard time today. And, um Whereas they shouldn't have, because once me and all Sam found out about this uh, Iron Alliance, you know, and we seen that America was different, you know, mm. for hundreds of years before all of our government was set up, mm. you know, there was um, there was Frenchmen, and Scots, and Cree, and Assiniboine, and Blackfeet, and Crow, and Ojibwe, and mm. all of these people in this one area, uh, from the Great Lakes all the way to the Rocky Mountain front. Okay. Consider that one small area. And for the visual people, that's <laughs> kind of like it's basically it's like the Canadian U.S. border, kind of going mm. west, basically from the Great yeah, Lakes. Yeah, from the Great Lakes all the way to Idaho. All right. You know what I mean? And that that was their domain. It was Everything called the Iron in between. Confederacy. Iron yeah. Confederacy. Yeah. And um. Uh, it was like a large group of people that can that included all those different types of people yes and we're mixed yes yeah. they all came together mm. and um they combined their traditions and their um their religion even mm. you know they were um there there's there's paintings and illustrations you know in the early 1800s which supposedly we didn't have cattle and wheeled carts and all these things up there you know but there's these uh, illustrations of these native camps and in these camps you see these men walking around some of them have top hats on and nice coats wow. and the other ones are sporting feathers and some of them are dragging uh, wheeled carts Métis there's there's French cattle Métis is mixed. Mm -hmm. Mestizo in, in yeah. Spanish you know Métis. and then they started calling them Creole because it's uh, I had a teacher in the yeah, all good. I had a teacher in the Dominican Republic. She was a 72-year-old uh, Afro-Chinese Dominican lady, and she told me the term uh, criollo came from uh, criado allá, which means raised over there. So when people from the Western Hemisphere, from the New World, would come back to Europe, people would say, oh, they look different, you know, they dress different, they speak different. Criado allá, they were raised over there, so that's cr criollo. That's a folk etymology, but basically you had these people that uh, were mixing, man, from the get-go, from the get-go. And and uh, there's a description that, I hope Luke had brought that quote. Did you bring that quote? Mm -hmm. Just about the psalm singing, sun dancing. Hey, do you have that quote, man? Pull that up. It's a beautiful description of the culture that existed up there. And that's the real spirit of America, man. Freedom. And like they're, everyone was mixed, man. That and like you, you, you were saying, you know, like your mom. Maybe tell us about how your mom was received when she came back with, you know, 
Because in modern times, it's a lot harder than we, they try to tell us now it's better than it used to be. Not necessarily. In the time of, the, of this Iron Confederacy, it, it was truly like um, open, free thinking. That people were, mm-hmm. that cultural appropriation, which we catch flack for yeah. today, it's a negative thing. No, that was a good thing with mm-hmm. these cultures. They're like, oh, yeah. what's that? Rollerblades? I like that. We both like rollerblades. You're Cree, I'm Celtic, you know, rollerblades are dope. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, whatever yeah, you guys sure. want to go, yeah. Yeah, so where I'm from, um, the Rocky Boy Reservation is actually, uh, they were part of the Métis. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, they, they were, what we read about was that um, they, they once... Um, you know, were, they knew they were all mixed before the government came and asked them, um, asked their leaders to make a list of, you know, who's oh, yeah. really Indian, you know, try to make blood quantum. And the chiefs I told them, it means your percentage of Native American oh. and one kind, which they wanted Cree um, for that reservation. Oh. And um, the tri- you know, the, the chiefs were saying that they can't do that because all their people are mix from like you know from um assiniboine to cree to blackfeet to you know scottish french you know they were most of the people were already mixed with all kinds you know so but they were forced to anyway so they you know kind of did it by more who was more cultural you know <clears throat> so that's kind of how it came down to who got you know enrolled and who didn't but and they actually made them Right, they made them uh, claim that. So mm-hmm. now, instead of being able to claim their family right. uh, blood, and and you know, some of them, like she said, were different tribes and everything. And now they're listed as Chippewa Cree by the United States government. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I I found it a little surprising when you just said you didn't understand blood blood quantum. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, basically, I grew up in New Jersey, mm-hmm. and um, there's not too many Native folks in northern New Jersey where I grew mm-hmm. up, and so, you know, until moving here, like Sam was saying, um, I didn't know any Native people. Right. Well, Rick was saying it was... And I don't act, have concept. It was an act of war mm-hmm. to make someone do... Because basically, once you declare a blood quantum, mm-hmm. unless you're marrying your sister or your cousin, each generation is going to have less and less until you're extinct, right? Exactly. And right. and that I'm we're the that. yeah we're the only people on the planet that are measured by our blood. Which people? Native American. Native, Native American people. We we All cannot right. be recognized by the federal government unless we carry a certain amount of right. blood. In and then our you have veins. a card and all mm-hmm. that. Exactly. All right. And it'll say what percentage or fraction of blood is left in your system. Mm-hmm. So Do eventually they... oh, you go. that blood will be gone and then they can erase all the reservations and they can erase all the Indians. Imagine, look at this guy. He's not recognized. He's not recognized in Canada or America as a, na- as a native. Look at this cat in the face. Well, okay. Well, there's so much here. There's so much you can talk about. All right, real quick. So, um, so okay. I didn't know about the cards until I went to an exhibit in Santa Fe. Is it AIAI American Indian Art Institute? Maybe I A I A. And um, they had a whole exhibit where they had portraits of people, and then they had their card to, sh- you know, mm-hmm. I don't know, just sharing like whatever it meant or what it didn't mean visually or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but in order to determine the blood quantum is that the phrase mm-hmm. does that mean they do blood tests or like no. so what does that even amount <laughs> no there's no i mean i'm glad they don't do blood tests. yeah our you know? blood is no different than any other blood that's what right. saying yeah i'm not they, i'm not a doctor go, are you not it? <laughs> i don't know if it's our, even the same our government like, made this up all right cool and they've, they've right. made even our people believe it yeah no, that's what i'm saying wow. and, and oh, even, even divide, our divide. people divide. now yeah, yeah. everyone's like i'm i'm a I'm a Chippewa Cree, you know, which I I thought that, you know, like I didn't know that there was any kind of division. And then my grandpa was an Assiniboine, which there was an Assiniboine Cree confederacy for a long mm. time. They were, they yeah, got walk, together walk. for years. And then later, you know, when they made the reservations, those two are next to each other. I guess they got them to not like mm-hmm. each other because 
Um, my grandpa is a Cinnaboyan and my grandma was Korean. There's always a thing about, you know, mm -hmm. like, it wasn't like... like they're rivals or something. Yeah. I know. I mean, I have a friend here named, and his parents are from different groups of people, and I was just amazed to hear about those issues, and I was just like, yeah. all right, you know, I don't know the context, and, you know, I don't know to what degree that was uh, government incentivized or whatever. Um, I mean, a lot of this reminds me of just, you know, what they do to all poor people basically around the country and the you know, world, but you know. Mm -hmm. And even anytime people get powerful like that, and especially if they're get, if, if, uh, because the Métis were known as the free people. Mm -hmm. When, when Sitting Bull, who, who, I mean, he went down swinging if anybody did, Sitting Bull never ever gave up. As long, he said, as long as there's a prairie dog to eat, I will be out here. You know, and he, when he would go up into Canadian territory, Basically, he self-identified as Métis. He wore this belt sash that, that you know, mm -hmm. which was, uh, you know, identified Métis sash. sash, you know. Mm -hmm. So he said, I'm one of the free people, even though he was Lakota, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, it wasn't even necessarily the poor, is that they were so powerful. Oh, no, I apologize. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. shouldn't have said it like that. No worries, but so basically, so um, as the... As the buffalo were killed out and diseases were rampant, tuberculosis took a lot of people out. Uh, one of the chiefs of the Cree, Big Bear, survived smallpox. So he was one of these rare creatures, you know, that somehow pulled out of it where it was just taking most people out, you know. Yeah. And so what I realized, too, is that treaties are an act of war. Such a subtle, horrible act of war. Because treaties, bro... Um, uh, Big Bear said, we'll take none of the queen's gifts. When we bait a fox, we leave all kinds of nice things out for him. As soon as we catch him, we club him in the head. You know, but the treaty, even to offer it, what I realize is that it divides the tribe. Because among the tribe, there's always going to be peacekeepers and there's always going to be war chiefs because you need both, right? And what the treaty does is divide the people in, uh, along those lines. And that's what happened with the with this alliance and you know i was just reading that same thing happened in palmares this huge maroon community in brazil it was thirty thousand people they had a, they controlled a region the size of portugal mm -hmm. and this was during slave time brazil uh, they were offered a treaty and basically it said all of you will be free all thirty thousand of you will be free and the leader wanted to accept it but the, his nephew nzumbi said if only 30,000, what about the rest of the 4 million Africans that were taken to Brazil? Mm. 4 million Africans, you know. He said 30,000, no. And so what that did, it's so both, you can see the wisdom in both, right? Mm -hmm. And it's such this subtle act of war, this offer of a supposed treaty, which were never, they never lived up to anyway. But it was this, it was really wicked the way those things would work on these folks that were already desperate. And you read about this guy like Thomas Quinn, this motherfucker. When people were starving, he would invite people down to the fort and let's say they were going to give rations and then say April Fools on these people that were starving to death, bro. And so imagine if someone did that to your people. And actually, um, wandering spirit, uh, this war chief among the Cree finally did him in. They ask. couldn't take it no more. Yeah, sure. They couldn't take it no more. You know, it's like if someone is just like rubbing salt in the wound to that yeah. point, they they killed him. And what it did was, of course, bring kind of like the last death blows right. upon those, you know, that. But uh, it's beautiful to hear about like uh, Poundmaker. Tell us about Poundmaker. This guy could lure the female, the lead female buffalo into these camouflage corrals called pounds, bro. And he had some kind of secret ability to <laughs> tell us about Houndmaker. Oh, yeah, well, I mean, there's something that I want to kind of bring up about him that was really surprising to me, you know, like, I've been on this real identity kick, you know, and uh, it seemed like um, when I'd look into Poundmaker, you know, and he's such a prominent Cree chief, you know, and um, in some weird way, you know, I used, to f I used to feel weird when I would see his pictures because he had dreadlocks. Mm-hmm. Some I've never seen. Mm. I mean, I've studied all kinds of native history, and, and that's all I've really hooked my my life on, really, is ever since I was little. And something about that always really struck me. 
and I I found it so strange, and I just I just couldn't understand why does this Indian native man have these dreadlocks, and so I had to look into it, you know, and um, I come to find out that a long time ago there used to be this Cree t- tradition, and it had to do with the men and their hair, and what they would do is they would do one side of their hair super nice and super fancy and they'd leave the other side just rugged yeah and it it was a sign for their devotion to their people they would put Mm. their vanity after the people you know and so they were only they were only fixing themselves up you know halfway Mm -hmm. because they didn't have time for the other half the other half was time to devote to the people and I, I found it neat how the men would show that you know in their style and how they would walk around with one one side shaggy and one side fancy you know and uh, it was really impressive to me and then all of a sudden pound maker came into my mind and his devotion to his people was 100 mm. percent and that was why he wore those dreadlocks you know and so when I when I came to that understanding, you know, I, I looked at the whole thing with the vanity and everything in a whole new light. You know, that's what I was gonna ask because how did, how does that realization? So my most recent immigrant relative is my grand my dad's dad, and he came from Poland because in 1915 or 05 he was the choke cherry. Shit's hitting. <laughs> gotcha. You know, he, he dishes it out the right time. It's like you gotta watch this dude. Right. Well, you don't think I don't know you, Sam? All right. So 1905 or 1915, whatever. The Russians sent him out of Poland. They were like, go to Siberia and die. And so like half his siblings died because they thought that since they spoke German, they were working for the Germans. There was a there was a piece of metal in the ground on their land. My great grandfather was a minister. You know, like, he didn't mean. Anything metal in the ground they thought that they were communicating to the germans from eastern poland you know it's just like and then eventually came america my point is that um i don't feel i don't even feel american like i don't even get it i just know my family lives here and i'm here and what the fuck is going on yeah. you know what i mean yeah. Yeah. anyway and then finally i realized like no no my none of my apparently genetics even apparently like i knew that you know what i mean but it's just like another thing i'm like the hell is this the closest thing i could come to it was recently i was talking to someone and not it's not really a well thought out concept but i was like americans are better than america you know because i was just like well the people i know are good people mm-hmm. i don't know that we represent whatever is being promoted to ourselves and everyone else yeah. yeah well just to answer that man i think that this quote from back in the day the original america was beautiful dog listen to this quote from who is it this is a quote by dr nicholas for Ver- Ver- Vrooman, Dr. Nicholas Vrooman. It was a presentation of the past uh, program series in January of 2015. And really, after hearing this, this quote and this description of this people, of this group of people, it was, it was kind of really great for my own sense of identity. You know, I've been searching for this identity for so long and, uh, this guy kind of summed it up in this one paragraph, and it's pretty outrageous. You know, I'm going to read it to you. Their vision questing, mystic traveler, tartan wearing, beadwork, cart train, cattle herding, china plate, um, tea drinking, hymn singing, medicine song, Sun dancing, genuflecting, fiddle jigging, moccasin footed, bullia bass, ruba boo, pemmican stew, buffalo pony, Celtic co- cowboy Indians. Yeah, that's America, what? baby. <laughs> what was the beginning of that sense? <laughs> I got the list and I heard the Americans, but I was Woo. like on the ride. What was, what was the beginning of that quote again? Vision questing. Oh, he just started with the list. Yes. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Yes, yes. He's, wow. He just goes on with every every bit of them that's included in their culture and in their society. 
And Which, this is about those folks in the north we were talking about. Yes, yeah, this Métis. is the Métis. Iron Métis. Alliance. This Métis. is the Iron Confederacy that was made all the way from the Great Lakes to the Rocky Mountain Front. And this was a group of people that was never defeated. Yeah. But at the same time, they were never recognized. And that's why I sit here today unrecognized by the federal government I, my name's Lucas Moccasin Gladue. My dad's a full-blooded Cree from Canada. My mom's an enrolled a tribal member at Turtle Mountain in North Dakota. Yet I don't carry enough blood to be included in this band, in, in either one of their bands. And so my identity is just like the, all of these other people in this group. And they're they're now called the Little Shell, and the the Montana, uh, the state of Montana is trying. They've already recognized them as a group of people, as a tribe of Indians, and they call them the Little Shell. Mm. And they know that they are all mixed in everything else. The federal government they don't want to recognize this. In in a way, I I'm happy about it, because unlike. My beautiful lady here, she has her tribal card and she has her prison number. I still have yet to have a prison number and be identified through the federal government as one of the conquered tribes or people. But I am of little shell descent and I believe I'm a true American and that's why my bro, he, you know, we're, we're not of the same people, but we're brothers. You know, and that's that's where we come from, and that's who Little Shell were, and that's I I believe that's who America was. You know, that's why they were medicine song, sun dancing, uh, fiddle jigging, genuflecting, hymn singing, Celtic cowboy Indians. <laughs> we might have been confused, but we were sure sure happy about it. You know what I mean? And everybody was having a good time, man. And I think that's what it's about. You know. We were, <laughs> We're all supposed to have a good time and accept everybody. Oh yeah, you go to they, up in Canada. They have powwows and they'll have jigging contests, and they'll have a bunch of Indians coming out there, and they'll be they'll have ribbon shirts or whatever, and they'll, they'll go out there and they'll jig, and there'll be people playing fiddles. I gotta bring my wife because she's from Australia and she loves like Irish yeah. Scottish culture. Twenty twenty, we're going. Yeah, Northern Journey, let's go. If I get some yeah, dates, I'll, I'll, I'll put it in. Where do you think, um, where do you guys think America should go from here? I, I think we should just drop the separation, yo, yeah. and, and accept it, each yeah, other, man. Was. Everybody's, you know, it's like, I, I think a lot of the religion before was, a, uh, there was a lot of fear based in there, you know? I, I think we, we, we pretty much got over our fears of, of those types of things, and Acceptance is the new new thing, you know. Accept people for what they're doing and how they do it, and which is a great point. And um, we also made a, made reference to the idea of cultural appropriation. Yeah. Right. So when I think about that, it's a very double-edged sword to me because I feel like on one side it's a it's a reflection of people wanting their traditions and their identities respected, especially by those who they feel as though can't claim it. Yeah. At the same time, it is kind of like a, a falsehood because we're always all mm -hmm. a product of what we've seen yeah, and heard. Yeah, human nature. Yeah, yeah. And I, I don't, I'm kind of stuck there as oh. an individual, you know? I think but, the government like forced us to do that, to, um, you know, make it wrong to appropriate or, you know, weird. And so we all have to be different. And, you know, that's not the case, and what, which it wasn't by the, um, the little shell. and. And then the Seminoles as well, the who who for years integrated, you know, brought slaves in, and so, so it's like we've yeah, always think, done that. I think there's a big difference between like exterminating a people and then calling your automobile a Cherokee, or like calling your automobile a Tuareg. That's a fucked up kind of cultural appropriation yeah. or something, or like saying that you speak for some other nation. That's obviously bullshit. In terms of like, if you see a nice shirt, that's a nice shirt. Don't, right. You know what I mean? It's like, right. that's a fucking cool fashion. I, right. I would wear that shit. 
And especially if you've gone to those places and met those people, it's like, for me, you know, and you know, people might look at me and think something weird, but for me, I went to that place, some brother, get we traded shirts, man, gave me that stuff. Of course I'm gonna prop that and fucking send him pictures like here, you know, whatever, you know, it's like, it's more on a personal level when you, I think, you know, and, and that's where we have to keep it. You know, as soon as, as soon as we start believing in, in that enemy talk and dividing lines and all yeah, that, yeah, yeah. then it gets real dangerous real fast, man, because yeah. how can you even tell? Yeah, yeah. My brother Farhat, he's, yeah. he's Uzbek, lives in Kyrgyzstan, was in China during some riots in the West, you know. Mm-hmm. And he said it was problematic because he kind of looks more Chinese, but he can speak Turkic. So, he's, you know, it's just like, and it's all based on what, you know what I mean? And it's all kind of like, um, obviously, you know, there's stories and stories about all the atrocity. But like what they don't, what's even more dangerous to know about is like all these times when like there was... 30,000 escaped Afro-Indians in Brazil that were ruling Mm -hmm. some section, you know, larger than Portugal. Mm -hmm. Why we don't hear about that, you know what I mean? Why why we don't hear about these Afro-Seminole people that were existing, you know, and not just surviving, but like numbers of people, you know, Mm -hmm. with their own language, with their own... And it's interesting even today, man, I got a... I, I just came back from Senegal and I sent my buddy a, a little video clip of these Apache. I took my kids to the Hickory Apache mm-hmm. uh, feast day the other day. So I sent them clips of their songs, you know, and, and the Senegalese brother was tripping. He's like, I'm loving this chant, man. It's like the it's like our <laughs> way of singing, you know, mm-hmm. like it's there's that immediate recognition. And mm-hmm. so um, and that's just appreciation. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And, and they're claiming that, you know. And and it's and it's funny like um, in Senegal, man. People call each other boy. And I was trying to tell my my translator Nyan, uh, in in America, you can't call a man boy, mm-hmm. like because of our history. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And he it went on. We, of course, he understood. He's a brilliant man. And he said, and he looked at me with a big smile, and he said. Okay, my nigga Sam. <laughs> you know, like, I get it, but we're friends, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but obviously you have to be sensitive because people have survived. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, just like. But I, I think I'm going to just kind of dive off on where you, you uh, brought it to the appreciation level, right? Because um, growing up native, yo, like, I, I wasn't around Indians. You know, and so when it comes to the cultural appropriation, like I, you hear all this stuff about the mascots and everything else, you know what I mean, and how that's uh, disrespectful towards the Indians or whatever, you know. And to me, I'm gonna be honest, man. As a little kid, every time I walked into a room and there was a white guy in there with a Redskins jacket on, I felt like he was on my team, yo. Like, I I loved it. I mean, I didn't see it as him being disrespectful to me in any way, shape, or form. That's a great point. Here's something that happened this morning. So I I was on the way to pick up my kids from school yesterday here in Taos. And um, I was in this long car line, which I hate anyway. And there was a a car pulling out of a parking lot, and I let them come in front of me. And um, I was in a goofy mood. I'm happy with my kids, whatever. And... um, and I saw that the front license plate was a Kansas City Chiefs. Yeah. Now, I don't care about the Kansas City Chiefs. I'm not into football or whatever. But I used to live in Kansas City. Right. So I was all like going to be like, oh, yeah, like I love the... I was thinking in my head I was going to say I love the Chiefs. But then I realized, like, no, this is probably... This looks like maybe it's a native lady who maybe <laughs> that's her relationship with the Kansas City Chiefs as an idea. But I was like kind of checking myself real quick because I don't want to put myself out there. You know, like earlier in the podcast when I said poor people, I wasn't calling people poor. I was thinking about it as like, as you know, in financial terms, the the people in power just fucking over anybody that's not them. But it's also not fair to use that because similarly to my hold back on the Chiefs thing, none of us are poor. You know what I mean? This is all just this made up shit. Um, But it's it's uh, it's almost a problem of language for me, and it's a personal growth to just like change your relationship with language. But but that's fascinating to hear that story because I. you know, again, man, you know, you have people who might still wear like a Cleveland Indians hat if they're native, but then you'll still have 
the shirts which I love that are like you know you're on native land or like uh, changing the LA you know logos or all these kind of progressive um, new new uh, iconographic yeah. designs yeah. but um there's a lot of ways I mean the thing is I almost feel like as a country pop culture country we're so used to like one person telling us what's right or wrong whether it's like Martin Luther King or whoever we you know yeah. put up there on a pedestal and I don't feel like we have enough of that right now if that's something that I'm personally used to to be able to call shots on um, but but again that then puts us back in that perception that we need to choose one or the other all the mm. time yeah yeah and I think yeah. that's a lot of the confusion I have as an American and maybe other people's do. Right, yeah. right yeah just like you said you have that you have the same identity issues like not feeling American like we all do and that's yeah. what's yeah yeah pretty amazing we all share pretty much the same experience and what I've been looking into like back in the day they were saying you know um you know, as America was coming together, everyone was going through the same struggles, pretty much, you know, mm -hmm. like... Um, the same changes. Yeah, same, same changes, yeah. fights, wars, and all this kind of stuff, so... It's like we we all went through the same mm -hmm. thing, pretty much. And, and now we're just getting presented with all this the same information, you know what I mean? And we're, we don't have enough information to make good decisions. That's mm. all there is to it, you yeah. know, they're just... They're flooding us with a bunch of stuff that doesn't make sense. And, mm -hmm. you know, the real truth of it is, is, man, we had a great idea before anybody even started trying to make rules around here. You know, we, right. well, our, our human nature did it first, you know, mm -hmm. and, and we were, we were living as a great people and, you know, we, we all accepted each other. And to me, that's shocking, you know, even, even to, uh, claim, uh, Métis uh, as as my people is is a, a, a shocking thing for me, you know, mm -hmm. because I always wanted to just be a Cree Indian, just be a full blood, you know, <laughs> because that's what I've been pushed my whole life. If mm -hmm. I wasn't that, I wasn't nothing, you know. And come to find out after I learned about it that these Métis they had it figured out, just like those Creoles down south, and you know they figured out their own way to live in a good way with everybody around them and not have to struggle and help each other and accept each other and you know what I mean it's just it's just shocking like what we have to go through to figure these little things out and then really what do we do after we figure it out you know mm -hmm. yeah, yeah yes exactly I don't know. and a lot of those that was just coming out of like <clears throat> you were saying this is this will be mind blowing like today we have 350 million Americans right pre contact they're estimating that there were 200 million inhabitants on this oh, continent man there's so many people so that initial um, slaughter and basically you're saying that like the chickens and pigs were responsible for probably a lot of the die off oh, yeah. right mm -hmm. so Okay, well, I don't even know if we want to go into that. Yeah, yeah. I got yeah. stuff to learn about that, too. So, so anyway, it's after there was people, so many died from sickness, and then there were people that had been stripped away from their culture, from Africa, from their families, everything. And so uh, it was out of necessity, you know. It was like it, it, was out, it was survival out of necessity. And up north, too, like if you're way up in the, in the mountains – of Canada, man, you have to get along. Like we understood that just yeah. in this last hunting trip, it's like people treat each other good out there, yeah. because you know how what a serious thing it is, you know. Yeah. And uh, so, of course, cooperation make more sense. And 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 obviously, for those people that were being quickly displaced and and hunted down and tried tried to be trapped, you know, and they would get away, because that's the, what people love freedom. All people, not just Americans. That's we try to claim that as like we're American. That's freedom. Whatever. It's like every living thing wants freedom. You know what I mean? Like you can't ever fuck with that. Like try to stomp it out as hard as you can. It will always. You know what I mean? But and, do you think we're any more free than anybody else? I mean, no. I know there's stuff. No, no, no. no. I, yeah, no, no. In like, different ways, but I don't know. Like, like, like we're real robots, you know, and we're, oh. you know, it seems like. Uh, I've seen through my own education that when, you know, people only grow to what they're exposed to, you know what I mean? And if you're exposed to something on the television screen or on the internet or something like that, you may think you know 
it or or about it you know or have some kind of understanding but it, it's really not until you're putting these situations in reality and that's why i think like all the the video and media and everything has such a uh, uh you know a harsh impact on our our people today you know because it's misleading yeah. you know so many people think they can get in these situations and they're like oh i would do it like this and i would do this <laughs> and it's like right. No, you wouldn't, you know, like, like, <laughs> you would not, you know, and, and, and it's like, it, we're, we're out of touch with reality, you know, a lot of people and, you know, it's just such an easy manipulation that our government's been putting on and it's really ever been since they learned how to print something on a piece of paper and you know they were like holy shit man this is what People dude i sold shit. 800 fucking apples today because we said an apple a day keeps talking about. damn print some more of those out you know what i mean it, it was a dude it's i mean if i was in charge and i figured out that's all it took to manipulate people was just kind of send them out a video here and there like wow dude great but i missed the i missed the boat instead of sending out a podcast (laughs) (laughs) record ceremony in your ear (laughs) this is the propaganda that you love to hear Shannon, would you tell us about your mother's experience when she came back from serving in the Air Force? I found that to be an interesting telling story of modern America. I was born in um, like 1982, and then my mom um, went away to the Army, um, where she met my dad, who was African American from Texas. And then when she came back, she told me she wasn't, you know, very well received by her tribe. And, um, any of her family. All right, yeah, her family and stuff, and, and it made it real fat, um, feel real bad. She wanted to, like, you know, just end it all for us and stuff. She thought we'd have a hard life and stuff, and pretty much told me that, you know, I'm black, Indian, and a woman, and in this country, that's really hard when I was at a really young age, so I was like, right. wow. But, um, you know, uh, my personal experience growing up on the reservation was completely different. Like, I always felt loved and accepted, and, you know, I never experienced what she did. But, and then I just recently went back, and everyone's like, hi, you know, you're home and stuff. And it was just like, like, wow, you know, this is my home. You know, like, I never felt like I fit anywhere, yeah. you know. Because, I guess, cause my mom's experience, you know, just like, I was wrong black. back. Yeah, my dad was black, and it made me feel bad, you know, like... I'll never be accepted, and, you know, and that that was hard, you know. And then later to, like, accept that, you know, you're black, <laughs> like, you know, mm-hmm. and, to, and to accept the fact that you felt bad about it, you know, that was really hard because I love my dad so much and my family, and, mm-hmm. you know, and I don't want to, like, ever be ashamed of them. And, yeah. you know, got me into, like, even looking into my own black culture and, you know, like, there's actually a culture there, you know, beyond America, and it's just like, wow, I'd really like to know that, you know. And yeah. Like, I mean, I don't know. Do you think there's, I mean, I don't know if it's just us four people here, but it, there might be a lot more people in, just because we're talking about this country, who are interested in looking, looking back at their ancestry, not because we're all retired and we're bored and we're trying to create our family trees. Mm-hmm. But just because, like you said, like, in America, like, we don't ever feel like we have an identity. I mm-hmm. feel like a lot of people don't. I just feel like the history <laughs> so. of this country is so fucked up. Mm-hmm. Like, why would I even want it to exist to be at all? You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like, I don't get it. And I don't even know where the fuck I'm supposed to be. You know, I've been to Germany and stuff, and I don't know that that's that much, you know, obviously they have issues in the history of all that. But, like, I don't know what other country is that much more of a home for me anyway. You know what I mean? And And I know that if... If or when I ever live in another country, I'm gonna miss America, mm-hmm. and I don't think it's because I don't know. I don't know if it's gonna be because I feel American, or whether it's just because of the mix of people and cultures that I love being mm-hmm. a part of and next to. I know right. that's a lot of it for me. Yeah. Right. You know. But really, I think I think that you know that is the true essence of America. You know. See, that's how people feel that's, inside. Is the mix of so. cultures and you know, and that sense of acceptance and. Somewhere along the lines, you know, they've got us to try and sway away from that, you know, whereas 
in everybody's heart. That's all you want to do is be accepting, you know, Mm. of other people and be happy, yo. And like, that's, that's how I see it. You know, I came down here. I've never been in this kind of, uh, culture i guess you know there's 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 a lot of uh different things going on here in taos that i've never seen i've been up north my whole life and uh i've never seen this kind of stuff you know there's there's a lot of free people living a lot different and uh that the temple that we go to um really mm. amazing to me you know yeah the whole uh, community like really comes together am- uh, amazing yeah. beautiful thing that I know most natives in Montana and where I'm from is they've never experienced anything like that. They've never, they don't have any idea that anything like that goes on, mm. you know, which is pretty surprising to me. And then I, I hear a lot of people say how they don't understand what's going on with us, you know, mm. and they're surprised, you know, we went to Texas with Shannon's family and their, her friends were saying they were surprised there was even natives my family's and, friends and uh reservations you know like that they even existed yeah they were like no. what are you serious right. real indians you know what do they look like yeah, they're, like, they're my, asking my, them like came what back years later they're like, you know <laughs> they were you know it, that. it was really surprising to me just to hear that stuff but that's how how yeah. uh divided we are yeah. you know yeah, like yeah, they've they completely understand. divided everybody whereas we used to be pretty accepting people, man. Right. And it was kind of roll of thumb in the wilderness, you know. You made friends with that guy way over there. Why? Because he has hunting grounds past there. Mm. <laughs> you can collaborate. Yeah. Maybe your daughter wants to marry him. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of stuff was That's good, right. man. Yeah. What were you going to say, though, too? You were going to say something. Oh, the original, original America, man. It was taboo for a man not to have a wife. So when people came, first thing that would happen uh, is they would find them a wife. Like, find this guy a wife. Because they knew that that was, like, a good, you know, natural yeah. way and, like, a good... Get incorporated in the system, basically. Yeah, huh? And it was built into all the spiritual changed. taboos. Yeah. You wouldn't marry within your clan, you know? So Never. Yeah. There's no full bloods. Yeah. Uh, no yeah, blood. you, yeah. Like, that's, a, that's a myth, you know, that the government started... Indians are all mixed, and if they're not, they weren't. They weren't very good, like hunters and stuff, yo. Like, <laughs> if they had to stay in their clan, yeah, yeah no doubt. That no. means they didn't have skills. Wow. So if they had skills, hmm. they was out hunting outside the clan, yo. Yeah. You know, Man. they would find the stray white girl. They would find, <laughs> you know what I mean? They would do what they had to do. But they certainly weren't hunting around in their own little group that they seen every day of their life. Yeah. You know, that just wasn't normal. Yeah. So, we're all mixed. We're all mixed up more than anybody imagines, man. And there was a whole time in history where it was taboo to have any black. It was taboo yeah. to have any Spanish. It was yeah. taboo to have any Irish. It was taboo <laughs> to have all these mm-hmm. different, you know, right, right. throughout time. It's a timeline. You yeah. can see where they made the rules and where they separated yeah. us, yo. And now, like, and now the corporate marketing people are trying to figure out how to accurately uh, engage and, and utilize the interest in people's uh, natural selves yeah. without making it look like they're trying too hard you know because they yeah. don't understand all that you know? yeah. it's it i mean i you know i mean some people say that the good part about the trump thing is that it's exposing what was already there and bringing mm. these conversations to dialogue and yeah i'm not gonna say that's wrong it's certainly heartbreaking to think that there's any you know. I think the main piece, like you asked earlier, Miles, like what, what do you think America needs to do? Sorry. It's, um, you know, you got to let go of fear. You know, I just had this amazing experience up on the mountain, man, where I, um, oh, bro, we were hunting so well, brother. I'm thank, thankful to God that we have meat for the winter, but I walked right up on a lion in its bed. And that don't happen, man. That's unheard of, you know. Like within 10 yards of this guy. 
chorus of white guy walks. <laughs> but I was covered because I was covered in charcoal. This brother told me he's like, cover your white ass in charcoal, you might have a chance. And uh, but then, so uh, of course, uh, the moment I saw this lion ten yards away, my heart jumped about three beats, and then I realized I gotta get my shit together because this guy feels everything. Started breathing real good, you know, and just grounded down. And I'm just looking at this mountain lion right in the eyes, man. And uh, neither one of us moving. And just looking at each other dead in the eyes, not moving for the longest time, I swear to God, like 10 minutes. During that 10 minutes, he flicked one ear, flicked a fly away with it, with his right ear. And I just moved my eyes to make sure he was the only lion in the vicinity. <laughs> there was a wound to left yeah, hand, right? Yeah, and uh, man... So I was close enough to see the markings on his face. He had this beautiful, like, V, gray, mark, white, gray, I think from maybe a kick that he sustained while hunting or something. He was a big old cat. I guess 250, 300 maybe. But anyway, the strangest thing about it was it was the most comfortable I felt maybe in my whole life. Huh. It was the most absent of fear I've ever been. In. And that's kind of like, paradoxical you know yeah but it got me there man it, and uh, even since that experience like i've had a lot less anxiety a lot less fear wow and and because this uh, i don't know i got some kind of transmission from this this cat this huge lion that was just uh it was beyond he's beyond fear of success or failure or right. or deliberating no just always so present and quiet and patient and mm. relaxed amazingly relaxed and so that's where america needs to go that's what i think because i see people on edge i see people scared of each other I see people like arming themselves and like getting into militia mode or whatever i see people really afraid you know afraid for their lives and the lives of their young ones but i really believe that the most powerful thing you can do in terms, if you're a real, true American warrior and hero, is um, get into permaculture, you know. Get into building up the land to where we don't have to import nothing from nowhere. And if the gas was shut off tomorrow, you'd still have carrots and radishes, and mm. your neighbors would have it too, and you know how, how to hunt, and you know how to fish, and you know. And we need to get away from this Babylon system which is just exploitative all the way it's just ex it's just extractive exploitation all the way and i hate it and i'll fight it to the day i fucking die just like sitting bull in the metis bro because real america is about fucking taking care of your own self-sustaining not about raiding mm. you know because no matter how many guns and bullets and cans of spam and crackers you got, you're gonna run out of all that shit. <laughs> oh, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And uh, and just how oh, much man. abundance there is if you slow down, you know? Yeah. I just made some. Well, you can tell me how's the choke cherry wine. See, it's that's just thorough, wild man. crafted. Yeah. That's, Open that that's wine. The real. You can make your own wine. You can hunt your own elk. You can grow your yeah. own food. Yeah, you yeah. can build your own house. You can. Be an American, have that American dream. So you gotta love but each you, other. But you're gonna have to avoid a lot of traps too, man. Cause you gotta just, love each other, man. Yeah. Cause we're t we're getting taught to hate, man. We're getting taught to uh, separate, and that's that's the last thing we need, man. Like I, I I even see it with my own people everywhere I go, man. Like every native I go around, man, they look at me like I'm the the real deal holy field man then they hear me talk and they're like wow you sound just like a white guy <laughs> you know yet yet at the same time they think i'm supposed to be on horseback you know with war paint or something you know like i was gonna say though when I, all you because you know we don't know each other that well but uh everybody here has a really good voice there's mm. like a real thick warmth in everybody's voice that it was nice to listen to from right. people at home. nice yeah Thanks but yeah, I hear you. Sure. I mean, you know, I, I, on the flip side, or similarly, I'm trying to figure what can I do with my white guy face? Like, what can I do? No, like, you're not white, Miles. But no matter who I am. That's a lie, bro. All I'm saying is, what can I do to, like, 
to make make use of this shit. You know what I mean? Like, cause I don't know, I don't fuck with <laughs> racist bro, people. I, I, I'm I doing it, but you know what yeah. I mean? I'm always about more. I want to do more. I think oh. that's great. You know, I don't know what to do you're, though. You're you're able to put somebody's voice out there. Uh, I I would have never imagined that anybody other than the people are sitting in the room with me are gonna hear the bullshit I have to say. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm, I have I have so much of it, bro. Like, I could hang out with you all the time. Dude. Well, we could do this multiple times. So, I mean, you know, it's. Uh, I, I feel real about it though, yeah, and yeah, I know yeah. it's I know it's legit, and I know I know mm-hmm. people could learn a lot, you know, just from oh, yeah. here, and, and just feel good you know, and themselves. that's the power, bro, and you yeah. having that and being able to put that out and leave it out there for people to grasp, and and yeah. you know what, it's never ending. Yeah, okay. that that stuff's out there forever, bro. And who yeah. could do that, yo? That's, that's right. well, you gotta do it at that's the a great level, thing, man. Right? You know, you got to do it at the personal level. You just yeah. have to do it the way that you do it, because you, I've seen you. You know, you brought me out to L.A. with you. I see how you interact with all the people of the world. You know, yeah. straight off the bat, we got taken to Koreatown. No, uh, oh, dude, <laughs> do you that remember? Was a great time, yeah. Our our driver, yeah, driver, dude. This guy took me to L.A. Driver was Korean, took us straight to Korea. Though. No, I see how you interact with people, man. And it's yeah, just, if you yeah. come with respect, yeah, yeah. aloha, love, whatever yeah. it is, man, look yeah. people in the eye. Mm. Be courageous enough to open up your heart and say actually how you feel and what's on your mind, what you're scared of or what you think. Mm-hmm. You know, that's what yeah, people yeah, in yeah, other yeah. countries have told me. They're like, you know, even though with this language barrier and it takes us a long time. Right. You and I speak about things that I don't talk about with other people because we're just taking the time to get there mm-hmm. and One spend the- time with people. Of other, you know, get and you're gonna feel awkward or stupid. You're gonna yeah. say stupid things and you're gonna forgive each other. You know what I mean? This guy's taking me to. This guy's family's taking care of me in a native way, and I don't know how to do that mm-hmm. properly or whatever. And I'm just trying to do it with respect. And I'm sure. You know, I'm borrowing my way through the world in a lot of ways as a white man, you know? Of course, you know? But be courageous enough to fucking take that face plant, you know, and be that cosmic clown to be like, hey, let's not take ourselves so seriously. I know I'm weird. Like, what's, you know what I mean? Like, let's be, and then once you say that, then everyone else says, that's okay. Yeah, I can get with that. That's crazy. I think it takes a weird person or somebody that, doesn't think too seriously of themselves to try to accept other people because I don't know I don't and that's how I made it through life (laughs) I'm so awkward that it's like I know I'm gonna mess it up so I'm just gonna be dorky anyway (laughs) just laugh at myself (laughs) this one dude uh, goes by Ocean Lottie but he told me um, just to be vulnerable like stay vulnerable Mm -hmm. he's experienced a lot of things and that really stuck with me because the times that I have been vulnerable, I mean, I don't even know what I'm vulnerable or not, but I know that in the, my ability or my willingness to be vulnerable, you know, in, uh, in decisions at certain points le- yields great things. Mm-hmm. And it's just because I guess it is, it's a lack of fear. It's uh, openness. It's, um, mm-hmm. allowing for things to enter your life because you're giving it space. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's a, maybe a takeaway for me from that. Yeah, and there was always those medicine people that were unafraid to 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 move across that line and say, "Hey, what's your name?" You know, and and yeah, man, and and that's why I want to take this guy to Africa and Central Asia, these places I've been, because it's the same guys everywhere you go. It's the same funny jokes. It's the same, you know, it's the same clowns. Good people, great, you know, yeah. good and bad humanity, and it's uh, if you're just willing to sit long enough to and and uh to get beyond whatever discomfort there is between you know the miscommunication at first or whatever like you realize these are uh these guys are same as you know yeah. same yeah. same yeah, so yeah that, that's exactly that's what, my, same, what my mom told me like when she went away to the army she was like she grew up on that reservation and then when she went away to the army she met like a lot of different people and she's like i just realized that everyone's the same you know mm. it's like yeah like yeah, my grandpa different. told me that too when I was young, you know, like, that everybody's the same, grandson, he said, no matter mm-hmm. who you meet, no matter what position they're in, mm. they still have your same thoughts, and they still think like you, 
They just put it out in a different way, you know. It's and so simple, yeah, to make it so hard. Yeah. You know? Yeah, you know, and so uh, it took me a long time to realize that, you know, and pay attention to people more and just have more appreciation and for patience. people. And patience. Yeah, yeah, patience for real. <laughs> that's yeah, a, yeah. That's what I learned because I even had prejudices too, like, you know, like. Yeah hatefulness and stuff from like people and like like you said everyone comes from different places they they all came from oppression and you know everyone's not mm -hmm. there's like this one percent who's trying to own the whole world it's not like everybody like yeah. i was saying like a lot of us in america before they were coming from hardships and running from it and escaping from it so yeah. a lot of people were going through the same thing mm -hmm. no matter what and i think that's were. why they were showing up and and just teaming up man like because it was hundreds of years, yo, that mm -hmm. this Iron Alliance was developed. Mm -hmm. Because all these Frenchmen and Scots, they were coming down from Hudson Bay in Canada. Mm -hmm. For a long mm -hmm. time, bro, before the, uh, uh, t it, what, in 16, 1700s, yo, they were already coming down. And this whole people was already here, and it's still there. It still exists, dude. Is there, is there much other, are you aware of any other books or... Anything out there about the Iron Alliance? Because I've never heard of it. I'm curious to learn more myself now. I've only actually found one presentation on it from that doctor that I mentioned before, that mm. Vrooman. All right. That's we'll look that, more into it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll find some more on it for you, but cool. that's, all, that's all I've ever came across, really. Mm. You know what I mean? And, and it's been very moving for me because that had more information than so much studying, sitting in the library constantly. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, I see this one guy's presentation. And, and what he did, though, was different. He studied the uh, illustrations right. of back in the 1700s, 1600s, and the these paintings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then he found these actual winter counts mm -hmm. of... These Métis people, and it starts people out with everybody's in feathers and this and that. And then all of a sudden, one guy has on a top hat and a coat, and he's mm -hmm. got a dog team and a cart and some cows and this and that. And this is before yeah. any of our understanding of when cattle got to here. And there, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It was, you know we were says. all, it was all misportrayed so badly yeah. that it's ridiculous, yo. Like, I used to really think that Indians didn't have cows and they didn't have wagons and carts and yeah. no, they did for hundreds of fucking years, yo. Because they weren't dummies, they weren't like, oh saying? no, thanks, man. We ain't using that fucking round thing, dude. <laughs> Who are you but saying? We're dragging our shit. <laughs> you know, like of course. Who come on. Had three or four carts outside. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, they got a picture, man, and sitting bull, right? First documented a fucking painting, yeah. uh, painting of Sitting Bull's yeah. camp. Uh, and it's his lodge, and there's three, no, four broke down pickups in his yard. <laughs> <laughs> no, I guess there's three broke down, and there's one that's running, <laughs> which makes perfect sense. <laughs> but I seen that fucking painting, bro, and it was like, right. oh my fucking God, Sitting Bull is just like me. <laughs> yeah, huh. he has some broke down ponies in his yard that he's using for parts for his fucking running car. And, you know what I mean? Like, it was yeah. so ridiculous. And this is way before we're supposed to have fucking carts and cattle and all this shit. Of the but time. it was already yeah. happening. We were yeah. already fucking modern. We yeah. were the fucking Métis people, man. We were. We had our own language that stretched from. All the way down here to all the way up in fucking Hudson Bay in Canada uh -huh. that everybody spoke. Yeah. The government ain't going to recognize none of that. They hate that fact. Yeah, I bet. You know what I mean? That's why they, they don't recognize me to this day. Because I'm one of those descendants. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love it. I love she has a prison number and I don't. I ain't never I been caught. Yeah, he's like, they ain't ever like, gonna catch me. Like, <laughs> well, I'm like half native. Well, any, any, I appreciate you guys' time and sharing all this. Yeah, and this was so cool. Any, yeah, any last so words for the people, real quick? And hopefully, oh. we'll do this again if you're still in town, you know. But 
Any oh, last man. words you want to leave people with? Either, either I, I, you'll you'll hear a lot more from me in the future, I believe. Cool. Uh, I have a lot to say, and I want to bring people together and make people happy. And you know, are there any ways that you would want people to? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just putting it out there. Do you have a social media on people to follow like that, or you just just let it let people stumble upon things as they come, or however you want to play we're, it? You know, we're working on a we're working on a book. They're putting together these two are putting together a book, and Neural's and Naps is right the forward, but it's yeah. gonna have some nice um, all these things that we've been talking about. It's nice to lay eyes on some of those old pictures yeah. and just see it because you know how they say a picture's worth a thousand words. So yeah, yeah. Working on a book project that'll come out in the spring about you know this iron confederacy and the afro seminole people and and also the rest of the new world like the garifuna you know the garifuna collectives mm. come and play in tomorrow that's, that's right. and they're uh, afro indigenous people you know there was a couple of ships that wrecked and the africans escaped and joined the uh, carib tribes there and so their language is has no european uh, influence at all so all yeah. these peoples you know yeah. that yeah. exist in the new world that are lesser known and uh, just kind of shine a light on on uh, the reality of that because there's a lot of you know uh, distortion right now in terms of uh, what America looks like or what it used to be or how great or what yeah. great yeah. means or yeah. But yeah, let's keep it great in a real great, keep good way, you know. Yeah, yeah keep oh, it, yeah. Mixed. Mix it mixed. Make America mixed <laughs> yeah. again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Thanks, everybody. I'm gonna keep it mixed, yo. to know how to help along the way full attention's paid to the national issues while locally we're blind waiting next to our tissues issues abound on the nightly news while we distract ourselves with the hourly views it's from the masses that we take our cues i thought social media would allow for more unique views but don't worry about me i'm doing my best doing that helps me relieve my stress don't worry about me i'm doing my best it helps relieve all the rest Maybe it's time to stand up and tell them I'm not true. Maybe they need to hear the right truth. We are the people who keep on living that it's not true. This is the best of that I'm not true. Maybe it's time to stand up and tell them I'm not true. Maybe they need to hear the right truth. We are the people who keep on living that it's not true. Sorry, that's me, yelling at myself as I'm watching TV, see, I threw mine out many years ago, but here I am as I watch another dumb show. It's like a window to the world from a small room. It's a break from my mind, cause most of the time I'm exhausted from the day that's gonna come again soon. Don't worry about me, I'm doing my best. It helps relieve all the stress. Don't worry about me, I'm doing my best It helps relieve all the rest, you know?